time we had a, a small plane go down somewhere in Africa, and we were not able to find it by surveillance. So the director of the CIA heard about a woman in California that uh, was a medium or something. I don't know the title for it. And she gave him the latitude and longitude of the plane's whereabouts. We located the plane where she said it was. And that's the only time that I have ever experienced something that was inexplicable while I was present. He was the most psychic man in the world, but nobody seems to know what killed him. It began with Russell Targ. The physicist in the beret there appeared at my door with a box of documents. Okay, so this is Barker 701. This is where the caretaker told me I should start. And I'm gonna see what this is. This is Marker 700. So indeed, indeed, Pat's grave is entirely unmarked. All right, I think he deserves better than that. This is probably my last opportunity to say goodbye to my good friend, Pat. Pat Price often said, the more attention you place on hiding something, the more it shines like a beacon in psychic space. Pat Price died in 1975. And some people believe it was because of his work with remote viewing. Psychic spies, Cold War whimsy, or secret weapon. Some people may have certain psychic powers. This may reassure you, it may alarm you, but in fact, for some years now, the U.S. intelligence community has wagered a modest amount of money on the possibility that such powers do exist. Such powers do exist. But the most enduring experiments have been in the field of remote viewing. We got into it when we discovered that they were in it. we found that many individuals are able to accurately describe what's going on in distant locations, blocked from any kind of ordinary perception. Are you saying that the work you've been doing is classified? I really can't talk about uh, matters of classification, as you can imagine. My name is Russell Targ, and I'm a physicist. This is our last chance to tell our story. I haven't been on a road trip like this for many years. They always assume that people are immortal. I hope the people who have seen and used operational material will say, yes, that really happened. A huge trove of material was declassified by the CIA. So this is really the first time that the people who were cognizant of secret material can talk about it. At one time, humanity worshipped fire. The shamans called it magic, and the people feared it. And now science recognizes fire as simply another part of the natural world. Ideas change based on new evidence. But the fear of the unknown remains. The future, the future, it all looms very large. What Likely if psychic we're... abilities were real? What if you could look anywhere using only the power of your mind? 
And if these abilities really exist, what would that do to the world when it found out? The CIA financed a project in 1975 to develop a new kind of agent who could truly be called a spook. Dad, when you, when you told me that you were interested in using uh, classified materials, that you were eager to get them out, and you were, uh, I was principally concerned for you. And uh, our family, no and, doubt. No, no doubt. Uh, we received the letter uh, from the CIA and said, uh, sorry, not now, but later. The said, well, Nicholas, I'm just going to publish the, the book. And I just thought that what could be more important than to help my father, one, get the documents that uh, he was seeking, but also to help make sure that he stayed out of jail. Uh, so that all seemed like a, a very worthwhile uh, enterprise. Yeah, very good thinking. And I then contacted the congresswoman in um, Palo Alto, and she submitted a letter uh, on your behalf as well. Oh, that's very nice. I didn't know that. Several months later, uh, the CIA released the documents that we had requested. And you were able to tell me the story in full detail. If I taught you to expect a miracle, it's been worthwhile. With the floodgates now open, an additional 70,000 documents on remote viewing were declassified. I can now show everybody these pictures without having to kill them afterwards. You can actually take out of thin air information about something you have absolutely no access to, just using your mind. If we want to know why the CIA was lying about our program, perhaps we should go to Detroit and talk to Kit Green, our former contract monitor. He was branch chief of the Life Sciences Division at CIA. I was given the results. The drawings showed the ability of a visual representation that appeared to be better than overhead imagery. In Pat Price's drawings, it was as if it was from inside his brain that the information was coming, not from his eyeballs overhead looking down. It was obvious to any intelligence organization that if you had an ability to be able to remotely perceive stuff, really remotely, like any place in the world, that could be an extraordinary intelligence source. The remote viewing program basically ran from the early 70s to the mid-90s. For more than 20 years, the CIA used psychic abilities operationally and in a top secret program for the U.S. government. You paid for them, you deserve to see them. CIA had said cease and desist. And people said, this stuff is so intriguing that we got back into the game. We once found a guy that could see anywhere in the world through his psychic powers. We could show him a picture of any place and he could describe any activity going on there. But he died, and we haven't heard from him since. CIA Director Stansfield Turner, Chicago Tribune, August 1977. So I believe when he died, he was out in Las Vegas or something, and, and uh, Kit Green rushed out there. Even though he died unattended in a hotel room, you don't need to make it a medical examiner case, although that's not correct. And he was taken to the emergency room, which I visited. Speaking now as a criminologist, I would have investigated the hell out of it. But the water is a little bit murky. So I'm going to change to a bigger fly that they can see better. Oh, there we go. We got one. So what do you do with it after you catch it? Catch and release only. The cutthroats are now pretty endangered, so you can't keep them. Where 
Yeah, the red is, it's like his throat's been cut. Yeah. Ken Kress was a long-term contract monitor at CIA. He was a physicist. Ken Kress became a mythic figure when he wrote a long paper in Annals of Intelligence describing our program, but he's never come forward. Kress had never been interviewed before this film, and every question we asked had to be submitted for vetting by the CIA. I was undercover. Uh, the fact that CIA was even doing anything with SRI was uh, confidential information. So Sid Gottlieb looked around, came up with my name because I was a physicist, and he called me in and he said, well, I'd like you to take over this project. And he said, the reason is, is there's two physicists at SRI, and I think you three can probably communicate. The first series of experiments here at Stanford Research Institute were what the scientists called remote viewing. For example, here is a reenactment of one of the first experiments last year. The subject was a New York artist named Ingo Swan. He was in the room. The experimenters, Drs. Harold Putoff and Russell Targ, were driving away in a car. Their destination was in a sealed envelope. This day it was Palo Alto City Hall. The subject did not know. But back in the room, the subject began sketching and describing where he imagined they might be. Here was the tape recording that he made then. There must be buildings around, and this would be sort of an area enclosed of some sort, a quadrangle or a quad. And then I sort of felt that there might be a fountain around, but I didn't hear any water in it. There is a fountain. That day, it was turned off. Back in the room, the subject sketched a pattern he thought was crosswalks coming together in a circle. In fact, the courtyard is paved in this pattern. The courtyard where they were is two miles from the room where the subject was. There had been no communication between them. Somehow or another, Kick Green and Ingo got together. And I, but Kick had a, came up with a report and he sent this back circulating through CIA and eventually got to Sid Gottlieb. Gottlieb was already predisposed to look at the psychic phenomena from 10 years ago. As the CIA's sorcerer, Gottlieb attempted to raise assassination to an art form. Out of his labs had come many debilitating potions. We knew who Sid Gottlieb was. He was the director of the famous MK Ultra program. This is by 1974. MK Ultra was the CIA's notorious mind control program in the 1950s and 60s, where they were giving LSD to people to see if you could create a Manchurian candidate and strip away their memories. We considered him sort of the Joseph Mengele of the American side. Mengele, of course, was a notorious Nazi physician who did biological experiments on Jewish prisoners. Gottlieb was not doing that. Gottlieb, of course, is Jewish. He was just torturing other people, independent of race or religion. He's sort of equal opportunity misanthrope. From my point of view, he reminded me of my old uncle, Sid. When he died, he was out in Las Vegas died. or something. In early 1972, I briefed NASA and the CIA on proposed experiments to help people develop their psychic abilities. Well, Helen and I thought it would be very interesting to meet with Sid Gottlieb. He was enthusiastic about the idea of giving remote viewers LSD as a way of enhancing their psychic abilities. I was opposed to that. Remote viewing requires the person's conscious cooperation. And we explained that to Gottlieb and he seemed to completely understand. So he led us down into the basement of the Pentagon and it seemed to us that he was sort of stored in the basement with all of his books. The only really comfortable place we'd ever been in the CIA. The idea after talking to Gottlieb that the decision to give us money to go forward probably had already been made. Reports that the Soviets were using psychics to spy on us prompted us to do the same to them. There was intelligence, hard intelligence. I mean, intelligence that was like 
really, really good internal program intelligence about what the Soviets were doing in, in medicine and, and psychology that stated that they believed that United States military, United States intelligence officers, and United States scientists would be ripe for recruitment as spies if they were interested in crazy things like psychic research, remote viewing, and parapsychology. And they would tell their government people that were responsible for doing recruiting and so forth, hey, if you want to find somebody in a Washington, D.C. area that might be pretty interesting, find somebody that spends their time doing psychic research. They must have been following Russ around constantly then. It's natural for a visually handicapped person like me to be interested in optics, magic, and extrasensory perception. I'm a legally blind motorcycle riding physicist. In 1934, I was born in Chicago. I was a child magician. I used to perform magic tricks at birthday parties and art openings. As a magician, I understand how people can be tricked. That's always made me a better researcher, especially in a field like ESP. I left graduate school at Columbia in 1956, and in 1958, I began working on the earliest development of the laser. And I was looking for a way to get into some kind of psychical research and still support my family. Russell was enthusiastic, and Hal was uh, more like what you would expect a theoretician to be. But they both came across as, you know, physicists. I heard that there was going to be a lecture at Stanford University, and there was a young physicist, Hal Putoff, giving a lecture on psychic discoveries behind the Iron Curtain, American and Russian ESP. And I then went back and talked to my new friend, Hal Putoff, and said, I think I got some dough. Let's talk well, to your I'm management about you. creating a program. And he said, that would be very nice. You just have to promise that you'll keep a low profile. So that was in June of 1972. And this led to the beginning of our program at SRI to investigate psychic abilities. I look forward to coming to work. Every day had a new miracle. I feel like the child magician finally got a job doing magic. As we were doing these experiments, we began to run into flack from the psychologists at SRI. They said, you know, you've got that crazy ESP experiments going on. That's going to ruin our reputation. We're going to lose our fun and get rid of those guys. Hal had worked for several years in naval intelligence in Washington, and that may have made him a little more secretive indeed. Yep. I had access to uh, one of the most shielded experiments on the planet. It was a shielded magnetometer that measures weak magnetic fields. Against his better judgment, Hal snuck his very first subject into a forbidden lab at Stanford. The man claimed to be the greatest psychic in the world, and his name was Ingo Swan. Swan claimed that he could move the needle of an unswayable magnetometer buried under 30 feet of concrete with a classified design used to sniff out nuclear explosions. It even had superconducting shielding. Its claim to fame was that nothing from the outside could affect it. Not only could Ingo perfectly sketch the design, but the needle moved and nearly got them kicked out of Stanford for breaking the experiment. And that got the attention of the CIA. I asked the CIA agents, uh, you know, why, why are you looking me up? He says, well, we couldn't care less about the fact that he perturbed that magnetometer, but the fact that he could look through superconducting shielding and see what was inside, that is really a concern. In a way, I can understand other people's uh, response to our work. If someone had come up and told me four years ago the kinds of things I'm now telling people, uh, I think I would have been skeptical also. Well, when I first met Ingo, of course, he was coming out with this claim of, quote, being a psychic. And at that time, before I started seeing results, I, I was very skeptical. And he was very confident. The psychic is a kind of remote sensing device. 
and that I think has a contribution to make to both science and humanity. To understand Ingo, I, I think you have to see a creative, highly intelligent, deeply wounded man who found in remote viewing a pathway to the acclaim that he sought. We might do an experiment that looked like a really good outcome, and he would say, no, 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 this, this is not so good, and he would come up with, up with some loophole. And so he would say, look, if we take credit for an experiment and then someone can come along later and find some loophole or some false positive, uh, then they'll reject it, and then even when we do good experiments, they'll reject it. He told me a story. He was a homosexual, which doesn't matter. I mean, who cares? But it mattered to him because he told me a story, which I've never forgotten, of being beaten up by a bunch of boys who he liked and admired when he was a youth. And I think he, he wanted to be acknowledged. I've often recovered many of the thoughts about existence I had as a child. A major one of these was the separation of consciousness from the body, which was very real when I was a child. This kind of thing happens in art. Uh, I believe and always have believed, and I've returned to it many times in my life that I am not this body in terms of consciousness, and consciousness can go places where the body cannot. It was very important to him to be validated by SRI. SRI was the first lab of a different order of magnitude from all prior parapsychological research. What SRI was always upset about is that during our day here, we brought in 1% of the money and 99% of the publicity. Back in 1972, SRI was primarily uh, a contractor for the government and some industry. With the riots in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, the fact that classified work was going on at Stanford University, uh, they, they didn't like that. Up until that time, most parapsychological research was done by small foundations on minuscule budgets operating in a corner of some basement. At SRI, the level of classification was uh, top secret. It took a long time to get the security clearance. You can't walk around, you have to be escorted because of the secret projects. Full of high-class scientific equipment, beeping and showing on the cathode ray tubes and all that. And when Russell and Hal got positioned there, it had a big impact. And on Ingo, it had a particularly big impact because the work that he did at SRI drew a lot of attention. To be in that kind of laboratory, they must be very important and really have a grasp of the truth. So you guys had a psychological procedure, the in-the-neighborhood thing, as it were, that was fantastic. And I think that's partially why you got such damn good results. And all of them succeeded in remote viewing. Drs. Putoff and Targ do not know how. And so maybe one of the most important things about the work done here is that it has been published in one of the most conservative and prestigious scientific journals in the world with this note. Few readers will finish without wondering for at least a moment if indeed ESP might be possible after all. What a difference that would make to us all. Jack Perkins, NBC News, Stanford Research Institute, California. Ingo was really the father of remote viewing in the modern era. Before Ingo, people were describing the picture in the envelope. Square. Good guess, but wrong. <laughs> He said, if I want to see what's in the envelope, I'll open the envelope. I can focus my attention anywhere on the planet. Give me something interesting to look at. And he threatened to quit. And so we asked him, well, 
you know, what, what do you mean? What, what, what would you like to do? And he says, just send somebody out in the San Francisco Bay Area and I'll describe where they are. Well, it takes a lot of guts to accept a challenge like this. The psychics involved could sort of get into it at a creative level and discover things very distant from themselves and then go find out if they were really there. Well, we had, by now, 30 analysts, not scientists, in CIA and maybe six or seven scientists in CIA talking about these initial dozen or so results of these anecdotal situations. We began by speaking of, of some kind of a, almost a psychic arms race here. Is there any real application to this? At that time, there were rumors, certainly, that the government was doing something. But nobody actually knew what was going on. Why? Are the intelligence communities chasing after this thing called remote viewing? What if there are no secrets? What's really going on here? They had to put resources on something that sounded crazy. That's what it was. And we would all talk about them and say, well, I know I didn't lie. I know you didn't lie. And we'd get polygraphed once in a while, and it became clear we weren't lying. That wasn't the issue. What's going on? These people from CIA were very concerned. They had one goal in mind, to prove that it was nonsense. Well, we've looked into your background. You've had these high security clearances. You've been polygraphed. We know we can trust you. The Russians have been spending millions of dollars over a decade at some of their best institutes investigating so-called ESP. No scientist in America even believes there is such a thing as ESP. In fact, it was because the Soviets had a completely materialistic viewpoint. Even in Lenin's writings, he said, since consciousness is an observable, it must be physical, and therefore physical things must have consciousness. And so he thought even atoms had some level of consciousness. And then the question becomes, how close does it have to be for you to see it? Can you see it in this room, in the next room? How about, can you see it on the other side of town? The question began to start formulate about distance. Maybe, like everything else that we know physically, it's quantum mechanical. That means it's spread out everywhere. It's not in space-time anymore. So that's exactly the same way that I can focus on my name being spoke. There's something about attention that, that I can use in order to narrow in and pay attention to something. So if I want to pay attention to what's happening on Pluto a million years ago, I should be able to do that. That's kind of what the remote viewers do. I mean, Ingo Swan was looking at Jupiter nine months before Voyager got there and correctly described rings that no astronomer had ever seen or even suspected. So how did he do that? Well, it suggests that the rings of Jupiter was in his head already. This becomes a very materialistic way of thinking about what's going on, but who cares? I mean, I'm interested in what's, what the truth is. We don't know how to evaluate this. We don't know if it's a threat or what. Well, I would say the difference between the American scientific community and the Soviet is that at the highest levels in the Soviet scientific community, psychic research is taken seriously, and there's no doubt about it. And you claim in, in this country it is not? I would say in this country it's not, because people are worried about the so-called giggle potential. Our normal socialization, being a psychologist now, is that stuff like ESP is nonsense, it can't happen. So if somebody tells you to do it, they're asking something stupid. And they banged a telephone book size thing down on the table. Paraphysics R&D, Warsaw Pact, from the Defense Intelligence Agency. When I thumbed through that and saw all the work that was going on. So the CIA was tracking all of these people. Yeah, in this case it was uh, DIA. Here is the report that I finally wrote that summarized uh, everything we could find. Uh, at that time, um, and it was called uh, Key Intelligence Question Number Nine. I, I labeled it paraphysics because I had to find a word that allowed us it, at the Foreign Technology Division to, to sense that there is a, a legitimate physics connection here. So, that, so let's just randomly, like a government support for parapsychics research 
paraphysics. Uh, paraphysics. Paraphys for... paraphysics um, returning with stories of official government support for such research. In fact, such support seems unquestioned by anyone. All of the Soviet centers, of course, are government funded. 1971. That's right. So especially over there, since everything was government funded, you had to take it more seriously. In principle, this document forms more policy than anything else that goes on in the, in the intelligence community. Why should the intelligence community be interested in it? Access information, you know, in a generic sense. Um, you can use it for communications, like to remote places, submarines, and that came up later. I thought they'd know they'd laugh me out of the, the room. So, so what was their what was their reaction when you positive. said that? It was positive? Positive. You got a positive reaction. Yes, they said, "Hey, this is good stuff. Follow it." When he wrote his first report, Dale Graff had no idea what he was getting defense intelligence into. Despite a series of remote viewing experiments that beat the odds at over one million to one. The CIA was still skeptical. The Army, CIA, DIA, they all had remote viewing programs eventually, but it all began with the NSA break-in. The real operational work began not with the bang of bullets and bombs, but with a whisper. I'm sorry, actually, I misdirected you. You were on the right... No, no, we should be up there. <laughs> about two psychics and two laser physicists that broke into the most secret NSA site that ever existed. It was a whisper that would eventually be heard around the world. The CIA had a new secret weapon. There was a hiatus, and then Sugar Grove came along. Mm -hmm. And somebody says this cockamamie thing, well now what we're doing is we're doing remote viewing by coordinates. And I say, what? It was codenamed Scanate. The Scan 8 program was started by Ingo Swan, and in that program where we were using coordinate remote viewing, if you were described what was located at any geographical coordinate of longitude and longitude, and would then describe what's there. And they tell me what this is. And I say something like, well, you're going to have to prove that to me. And the door opened at the end of the hallway, and a guy walks out. Could you give me some coordinates, just map coordinates of a place that you know? He says, this will do it. He says, I'm positive you don't know anything about what's there. I said, perfect, perfect, perfect. I took them. And then Kit gave Harold's coordinates that nobody knew about. From Ingo's standpoint, he said, this is really a sexy target. It's got all kinds of antennas. Uh, Seems like a very hush-hush place, very military, and he drew how things were laid out. The results came back. So specific on paper that I was just like, I was kind of nonplussed. It included a diagram, guardhouse, uh, accordion doors that roll up big enough to put a jeep through, four stories below, hallway, cipher law and I took it to my colleague Dave who would give me the coordinates and I said here he said man green this is nonsense I said are you are you really really sure and he said man I gave you the coordinates of the log cabin I just built in West Virginia. Uh, so I called up my colleagues and I gave them the results and I, I, I'm sick of it. And just before I hung up, the fellow I was talking to, who I, I, can't, I can't name, but whose initials were Russ Targ, said, that's really too bad. It's really too bad, really too bad. The other guy found the same thing. Uh, early in the SRI program, uh, there had been some publicity, and uh, Pat Price had read about it. That happened to be right when we were, had been asked to target on the West Virginia site. So it was over the telephone saying, you know, I used to be uh, maybe police commissioner or something like that in Burbank, and sometimes I would get intuitive flashes about some crime scene that we were working on, and it would turn out I was be right. Maybe I should be a subject. SRI comes up with Pat Price. 
he had a map on the uh, over his desk, and he had a bunch of pins on the map of the world, and their pins were all stuck in the ocean. And I asked him, I said, Pat, what are all those, uh, you know, pins? They're just scattered all right. He said, oh, I'm following all the nuclear submarines in the world, and I move the pins around, and I relocate them. For an intelligence officer, I mean, this would be one of the most fundamental breakthroughs in, in naval intelligence if you could follow all the submarines in the world. Pat Price was brought in independently to describe the same target location and went on to read documents hidden in the vault three floors below the surface. I said, that's really interesting. Okay, yeah, okay, talk, I'll talk, talk. What did you say? And I drove to the coordinates and I found the cabin. And 100 meters down the road, I found a dirt road from the cabin. I drove down it, found a guardhouse, found a dish, found the accordion door. This naval installation's purpose is to perform communications research and development for the U.S. Navy, the Department of Defense, and various elements of the U.S. government. I reported that. It got to the office of research and development, it got to the office of OTS, and there was, you know, a huge controversy. I mean, and and it started as very small ball. But what the person who picked the target didn't realize was just right over the ridge, a mile or so away, whatever it was, was this super secret facility for picking up Russian satellite information as it went overhead. And so both of them said, ah, Maybe that's what they want us to describe. In the 1960s, Sugar Grove became one of the NSA's most important Cold War listening facilities. And then the whole thing blew up. But remember, it was about what was inside that building. File folders with the following names. I remember that they were all associated with a pool game, like play, playing pool or billiards. filing cabinet on the north wall, labeled Operation Pool Q. Four ball, eight ball, rack up. I'm, I'm saying, uh, you know, this is reminiscent of his uh, visit to the place that Kit took him. <laughs> Within 24, 48 hours, I had security officers in my office at headquarters. And, and they were grim-faced and they were upset. And I've been told, I was told this officially, it's been made public. The filing cabinets were there, they were green, there were file folders, and they had the exact three names on the file folders. Now, uh, that was the first thing that was important, is that they were correct. However, those guys out in California got the code names they got code names that were part of a special access program. Not just code names. They got special access program code names which were classified top secret. Which the were names were classified top secret. We were then descended upon by all the law enforcement of the United States. We had government agencies from NSA and CIA coming to visit us and find out why the CIA had targeted a group of psychics to go spying on the NSA. So I, I didn't know whether to be sick to my stomach or what to do. So it wasn't just Kit Green, it was the owners of this site. And you know, some of it, like some of the names that I told you, turned out to be accurate. And so, you know, the first concern, a security leak. Somebody has let this information out. If I was director of intelligence or even the president, and I was briefed on what you just told me about those code words, I would think that this was either a propaganda thing, or I would think that there's a guy who could probably look inside a nuclear missile silo and give me the launch codes. And that guy is really important and potentially dangerous. It's either a hoax or it's real. 
I know. <laughs> now, if you're asking me where I sit, it's in the ladder. You know, what really is going on here? Do we have a counterintelligence issue where people can do this sort of stuff against us? And of course, the other side of it is, hey, can we do it against somebody else? <laughs> How would it be if we spent half of our time on operational targets for the CIA and half of our time doing research? And he said, I understand what you want to do. That would be fair. Everybody knew that there had to be some foundational science or this stuff would never be accepted. Stanford Research Institute has been conducting an experimental program in the field of psychoenergetic effect. I had Hal and Russ bring Ori Geller to me, who was supposedly be, you know, one of the psychokinetic people who could take and bend spoons and do other magic kind of things with materials. And we had an experiment set up. Fifteen drawings were placed in double sealed envelopes in a safe for which none of the experimenters had the combination. This is Geller's representation of what he believed was sealed in the envelope. This is the most off-target of the drawings that he did. As you can see, he is quite elated about getting the right answer. Hey, this is real. Don't you try to debunk this, because it is scientifically proven. And I can tell you the uh, agency did a little background check on, uh, on Ori and found that he might be working for uh, some other government, shall we say. And so he was just dropped, there were security concerns. The worry was that there was national security information that could be gathered. What he said was that he mushed his head into a safe and these words popped into his mind. <laughs> when a CIA analyst reads this and says, what? Does that mean if I have a document on my desk uh, that I consider highly sensitive and classified that there could be some Russian psychic a thousand miles away reproducing what I'm looking at? Suddenly the lights came on and we had CIA money and fresh support for our research. Ooh. Our CIA handlers warned us to be wary of bugs, phone taps, and even honey pots. We could see anywhere, and they had unlimited resources to back up our claims. We even had a degree of fame among those in the know. It was like a dream come true. new funding and assignments from the CIA, it seemed as if Hal and Russell could do no wrong. What kind of place do you experience them at? Attorney General from somewhere in Northern California came to us and said, would you help us with this case? She's been kidnapped. The heiress had been kidnapped from her Berkeley apartment. As we walked in, the police were very excited and they said, we have a lot of questions we want to ask you. And Price said, let me show you how we do this. Let me see a mug book. And he put his finger on Donald DeVries and said, that's the ringleader. The Berkeley police said, we know who he is. He walked away from a minimum security prison a year ago. And he said, you know, this is not um, your regular kidnapping for money. This is some kind of political thing. And then she's photographed in rob robbing banks alongside the with, you know, with an AK-47 or something like that with the other crooks. I get this image of crosshairs, looking at crosshairs. Uh, well, getting closer, it's uh, more like an intersection. He told us where the car that they had kidnapped her in had been left. Across the freeway are two large white gas storage tanks. And one of the detectives said, well, I know where that is. And so the policemen ran out and they actually found the car where he said. And we went to a shack they thought might be a hideout. And I had the experience of the detective handing me his sidearm and said, you know how to fire a pistol? And I said, I happen to own an automatic. Yes, I do. So he didn't realize that he handing Mr. Magoo 
uh, an automatic so that I could cover his back. This is the assignment outside my job description. Continental flavor. We were basically detectives in the case, on the street, boots on the ground, so to speak. Problem was that the Berkeley police did not cooperate with the Alameda Sheriff's Department, the county sheriff, and neither of them were cooperating with the FBI. It was only after the entire thing was resolved we found out that that indeed was the area where she was being kept and the layout in the apartment was as he described and in fact she was being kept in the closet. And we got a formal commendation from the Berkeley Police Department. Unfortunately, a lot of people got killed in the meantime. They attracted not only fans and law enforcement. The CIA had gotten, they had gotten hold of Soviet documents in which our names were in there as targets to be tracked and to be turned if possible. That's, as I said, well, then, then we have to take this whole thing very seriously. And I began to feel frightened. This felt like mm -hmm. a penetrating into a dangerous area. When he died, he was out in Las Vegas. When he died, he was out in Las Vegas. Medical circumstances would admit to a coronary and would admit to what he said he was suffering from, which was uh, poisoning. Particularly, he said, a food poisoning. Later on, somebody said, well, you know, the KGB did a man. And I said, oh, yeah, I've heard these rumors. You know, I have no reason to believe that. This appears to have been a state-sponsored assassination attempt. Statement of the Prime Minister. But now, eight days on, Theresa May came to the Commons. In her hands, one of the most remarkable statements she's delivered as Prime Minister. It is now clear that Mr. Skripal and his daughter were poisoned with a military-grade nerve agent of a type developed by Russia. This is part of a group of nerve agents known as Novichok. It causes suffocation and heart failure. I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, there was a TV program recently, I mean, this was a decade later, where they were interviewing an ex-KGB agent who had been involved uh, with an assassination squad. And um, they, the interviewer had asked him, you know, what do you do? How, you know, how do you carry out assassination? If we had somebody who was a target, we'd find out what their medical profile was, and then we would do something that would uh, cause that medical condition to go south quickly, and then it'd just be assumed it was uh, a medical event, and that way we would we would be you know wouldn't be found out. And uh, and so the interviewer, I'm told, I haven't seen this program yet. I haven't been able to find it. The interviewer. Uh, the interviewer said, well, did you ever actually use that approach? And they said, yeah, once on a psychic who worked for the CIA. Our husbands and wives. Uh, they really do, for instance, have a Soviet experiment in remote strangulation. Larissa Velenskaya was put in charge of monitoring SRI's ESP work from Moscow. Kamiansky was in Moscow and Nikolai was in Leningrad. Uh, Kamiansky imagined that he tried to strangle Nikolai. Nikolai was on the way at all, but he uh, felt that he couldn't breathe. He was on the edge of unconscious state and uh, suddenly everything disappeared just because uh, Kamiansky in Moscow stopped to transmit this image. I do solemnly swear on will to the best of my ability to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. I got frustrated as I realized I may be trapped in our own success. Everything was now a secret. I couldn't even tell my family. Our phones might be tapped. The only thing secret about this program, mm -hmm. what is it with the secret program? But we weren't publishing anything. We went to the CIA handlers and we said, look, you've got to let us publish some of these experiments. Everyone's beginning to say, well, gee, maybe it's a secret program. So anyway, we got their permission to uh, put together a series of our Bay Area remote viewing experiments and, and, uh, and publish them. They wouldn't let us publish the hot stuff and they didn't care about the bigger implications of our work. Maybe I had made a deal with the devil. 
I said, have them go back and get some more. Well, the obvious thing was to do something on the operational side. So I started searching around for a project that would have some impact. It was a research facility. That was all that we were going to tell them. So this was our very first number one Soviet site. Pat Price uh, was the remote viewer in this case. The CIA people came and just gave us coordinates and said, you know, look here. And so he leans back in his chair, puts his glasses on, and I'm looking at him and I'm saying to myself, why does he put his glasses? He said, no, he said, I put my glasses on because I can see better <laughs> remotely when I have my glasses on. And I'm sitting there thinking, yeah, okay. We sat down with our coffee and I said, here's the target, Pat, what do you, what do you see? Next morning, they came back with a sketch. And we showed him the picture. So I go over and I say, well, I've got this science fiction fantasy crane. Uh, <laughs> well, we looked at that and, you know, were quite frankly astounded at the, at the uh, similarities. And he unrolled a big picture of an R&D facility and right in the middle of this facility was a photograph of a giant gantry crane. So the sketch on the, on the left is what Price produced, and this one is the one that is derived from the uh, photographic, or from the sketch from the photographic image. He said, oh, this was a huge crane. He said, I saw somebody walk by and it, and the guy only came up to the, uh, to the axle or something on, on the wheels or up to the top of the wheels. Pat, what do you see about underground? He said, one of the big things they're doing here is making these 60-foot spheres out of steel. They're actually 58 feet. What I was told was the analysts of Semipalatinsk did not know about the Gores. They finally rolled out a 60-foot diameter steel sphere that's part of a containment vessel for a particle beam weapon to shoot down American surveillance satellites. Exactly what Price described. The end game is this big review of cars all operations oriented testing from a contractor like SRI should stop. So in other words, CIA's decision was because of security concerns, they were going to cut out SRI and work with Pat directly. So we, they did so. The CIA moved Pat Price to a farm in the outskirts of Washington. He was doing day-to-day -day spying for the CIA. We've broken into some foreign embassies in foreign countries, and we bugged them. And we have the operational files. So what we did is we got Pat Price, and we brought one of the people who had made this entry into the room with Pat. So we gave him a photograph of the outside of the building. But the goal of those operational people was to find the code room of the embassy and basically bug it. So they needed to get in the embassy, find it, place a bug, and get out before the guards opened up the next morning. He supposedly located the physical place in the embassy that was the code room area. So according to the operations guy, yeah, he found the place and they should use him again. He was inside the code room. Silent Core, Tampa Street, and that's it. So he's a wizard of Silent Core. Hello, just dropping off Russell. Come in. Thank you. Uri Geller knows a lot about code rooms. Uri says he spent a long time working for Mossad, so perhaps he knows what happened to Pat Price as well. If you can tell me, what was the meeting about? What were you doing in the 
secret room in the Capitol. Okay, they actually. They must have been briefing somebody. Yes, actually, there were ten. There are there are probably two or three shielded rooms, different levels, but it's actually in the Capitol dome, the shielded room. It, it is a room where no eavesdropping can take place because the walls are leaded, etc., all kinds of materials, even the plugs are, are different. And, um, and, you know, it can also be a wine cellar. So while doing secret work, That's fine. you can drink wine and get drunk. Okay, well, I wanted to, uh, so she owned a room with a perfect conversation. Yes. And I want to talk to you about the death of Pat Price. And Pat comes in with his description of an underwater sabotage training facility several kilometers away from the seacoast. And this information was passed on to the Libyan disc. There, there were, they saw a facility, basically, where he said that, that they hadn't seen before. And a few days later, Pat Price died. This was the end of Pat Price. CIA hired Price away from us, and four months after joining the CIA, Price was dead. And the big question is, was he killed or was it a natural death? Like in the movies, you want to know, did he jump or was he pushed? What do you think? Uh, the emergency people, emergency department people said that there was an individual that came in with him, with a briefcase, that showed the attending physician in the emergency room his uh, recent EKGs from uh, Greenbrier, which was the facility that I knew that we'd taken him to to get his cardiological workup uh, some months ago, and basically said, look, here's the guy at rampant, serious coronary artery disease. He had a heart attack, so even though he died unattended in a hotel room, they decided, they meaning the hospital and the police, to not make it a medical examiner case. So they didn't do an autopsy, although that's not correct. And the man disappeared with the briefcase, with the notes. They never took any records of it. Body was removed and cremated. And then they called his wife. Yeah, wow. Price was known to have a heart condition and he may have had a heart attack. That's it. Next. The Russians may have killed him. And the third. In my opinion yes. is the CIA discovered quickly they had a terrible problem. After Price's death, it emerged that his church may have been attempting to blackmail the IRS using classified documents. There's a file cab that's got a folder full of this stuff in it. This church had a problem with the government. He would go back to his church officials and immediately give them a debriefing of everything that he said and everything that I said. Here the guy who was walking on water was a traitor. I do not think he was a spy for his church. You know, I was, I was shocked and devastated because I had no idea about this. If he walks into the president's office and reads the nuclear code, if it turns out that Superman is a double agent, what do you do? If he didn't understand and misinterpreted what it was that he could tell his confessor in his church, I forgive him that. That's not Pat's fault. Knowing intelligence, knowing um, what's happening around the world, and having worked for certain, um, you know, agencies. I know a little more about this story. That's exactly why I wanted and to talk to you. people who are so valuable are never taken out. They tempt them with amazing circumstantial mm -hmm. or monies, dwellings, houses, to work for them. They will never, this is like killing the, the, the goose that lays mm -hmm. golden eggs which would have enabled the CIA to use this poison for killing people. Does this pistol uh, fire the dart? Yes, it does, Mr. Chairman. And a special one was developed which potentially would be able to uh, enter the target without perception. Well, the CIA 
had a heart attack gun that was revealed. Okay, now, the CIA is not in the business of killing people. Well, they were in the business of making a very complicated killing machine. And they got in a lot of trouble for that. I, I saw Pat shortly before he was killed. He, he was coming to see us. Yes. But before he left, he called several of his friends to say goodbye in an odd way. So, in short, he predicted his own death. And he purchased a $1 million term life insurance to give to his wife, Anne, at the airport. I, you see, I didn't know that. Interesting. And uh, he changed his trip to visit his son yeah. in Salt Lake. Maybe he had a psychic feeling that he was about to die. He must have been one of the greatest psychics in the world. Yes. Some Army remote viewers tasked themselves on Price's death years later and decided he was still alive and at work. Of course, this was just speculation. It was entirely unmarked. He deserved better than that. Shortly after that, Hal and I were called back to Washington for an investigation. What the CIA had hoped to squash by eliminating SRI's contract would only grow after an Aviation Week article released after Pat's death perfectly matched his description of the gores of Semipalatinsk, something no one else in U.S. intelligence knew. This shook the halls of power and set into motion new fears about Russian psychic spies. The question is, why? What was happening in July, August of last year? The House Committee on Intelligence Oversight decided there must be a security leak that gave the California psychics information that no one in the rest of the intelligence community had. Well, actually, I was excited about the opportunity to brief them because by this point in our career, the more people at high levels who knew about what we were doing, uh, the more support there was to make sure that the program went forward. Unfortunately, you will learn today that these efforts by Russia to discredit the U.S. and weaken the West are not new. All I can say is that if the results were faked, our security system doesn't work. What these persons saw was confirmed by aerial photography. There's no way they could have been faked. There are four senators out there fighting uh, to keep it going. What's next? Are we looking at a new Iron Curtain descending across Eastern Europe? And we were supported for another decade. One physicist said, there was no point in teaching physics anymore because we'd learned all there was to know. And now we look back and realize that what we thought we knew was the tiniest fragment. Although the CIA publicly denigrated the idea of remote viewing and claimed to end interest in the subject after the death of Pat Price, SRI's rising profile led to partnerships with every single branch of the intelligence community. Defense Intelligence Agency took on a contract with the U.S. Army in 1978. It begins, but this being the Army, it really starts with drill, naturally. Over 3,000 troops in Fort Meade, Maryland, were screened by Army intelligence to find the top six that would spearhead the program. That first day in the company. These were grunts, regular guys. Vietnam vets picked because they had a knack for avoiding landmines and the CIA didn't like it. It caused leaks. The most decorated was remote viewer 001. Chief Warrant Officer Joe McMonagle. The Stanford Art Museum was Joe McMonagle's first ever remote viewing. We then did five more trials with him. Altogether, we did 36 trials with the six Army volunteers. Out of the 36 trials, these officers were able to get 19 first place matches where one would expect only six by chance. The odds of such an excellent result is better than one in a million. Joe got the Legion of Merit. That is a very big deal. It is the second highest non-combatant award 
that the military gives. He has done more live to tape remote viewings than anybody else alive. He lives at the top of the mountain where every great prophet lives. He was the first to speak out when parts of the program were publicly outed in 1995 and subsequently denigrated by the CIA. It may have helped locate American hostages in Iran. There were two or three uh, others that were held away from the embassy. No one seemed to know exactly where that was, but we were instrumental in helping identify that location. I was paid to do remote viewing by the U.S. Army for six straight years. And indeed, he turned out to be one of the most psychic people we ever worked with. You can actually take out of thin air information about something you have absolutely no access to, just using your mind. Remote viewing was first brought to my attention by Skip Atwater. It occurred to me I had been nine or 10 years doing this counterintelligence work. When I said, Colonel Webb, I, I brought this book called Mind Reach. And if what they say in this book is true, there's a huge gap in our counterintelligence effort here. I left the book Mind Reach with him, and the next day I came in and he says, you're right. If this is true, what's being said in this book, this is something that we aren't attending to. This might, in fact, be a threat to uh, the intelligence community. One of our greatest operational successes was when Joe McMonagall pinpointed and described an enormous Russian submarine in a location where it was totally unexpected. There was a very, very large building. We didn't have enough intelligence by ordinary means to know well, what is being built inside that building. The building was uh, hundreds of yards from the water. What I decided through remote viewing uh, was that they were probably constructing a new submarine. And the submarine was unique in that it had twin hulls. And the, the hulls were actually stuck together this way. So it was a twin hulled, very wide submarine. It was half again larger than any submarine in existence at the time. It had uh, dozens of new capabilities. And I said, they're going to launch in 120 days. And this was all disagreed with by the senior officer from the CIA. He made arrangements to, to look at the area 114 days later. And uh, they, in fact, had launched the largest submarine ever built in history. It's called the TK-089, the Typhoon-class submarine. The only response we got from that individual was, it was a lucky guess. And that individual was Robert Gates. Did you at any time feel that this was worth the taxpayers' money? Well, all I can say is that in the, in the 20 years or 25 years that I was perhaps in a position to be aware, uh, I don't know of a single instance uh, where it is documented that this kind of activity contributed in any significant way to a policy decision or even to informing policymakers about uh, important information. In October 1983, Secretary of Army John Marsh was briefed by Lieutenant Colonel Busby of INSCOM. His report stated that 350 of 700 remote viewing missions, or 50%, were deemed to possess intelligence value, and 85% showed positive evidence for remote viewing. We probably collected more intelligence on that one submarine in four days than the entire Soviet sub-pack. What you have to understand is the program operated year to year uh, based on its successes, not its failures. And the fact that it was funded on a year to year basis speaks loudly as to why it existed for 20 years. And the chief proponent in terms of tasking or the one agency that probably used more remote viewing than any other agency was the CIA. I'm familiar with that quote of Gates, there's nothing, we, we, we closed the program because it didn't amount to anything. Let me just read this one thing I've got here. Joe got the Legion of Merit, and Joe, upon his retirement, got this. While with his command, he used his talents and expertise in the execution of more than 200 missions, addressing over 150 essential elements of information. 
These EEI, essential elements of information, contain critical intelligence reported at the highest echelons of our military and government, including such national level agencies as the Joint Chiefs of Staff, DIA, NSA, CIA, DEA, and the Secret Service, producing crucial and vital intelligence unavailable from any other source. That would tend to suggest that Gates was not telling the truth. We had the total support of five administrations in a row. Carter stood up and said, we did this wonderful thing when they found the Tupolev bomber. And, and the reporter said, how did you find it? He said, we used our psychics. We're on our way to see President Carter and talk with him about our mission to find a downed Russian bomber in Zaire. We helped him pull the Soviet bomber out of the jungle before the Soviets could find it. Let's see if he'll acknowledge that, as he did in his recent autobiography. One time we had a, a small plane go down somewhere in Africa, and uh, we needed very much to find out where that plane had crashed. And we were not able to find it by surveillance so the director of the, of the CIA heard about a woman in California that uh, was a medium or something. I don't know the title for her. And she gave him the latitude and longitude of the plane's whereabouts. We located the plane where she said it was. Now, that's the only time that I have ever experienced something that was inexplicable while I was present. One evening I'm called into the office, I was working late, and I said, we understand that you have some people that can find things. I said, yeah, I have the SRI contract, there are people on, on staff there. So they said, well, this is really a top secret, you know, burn before reading kind of project. Here's a picture of an airplane that's missing, and how can we, can we get into Africa and get to the airplane before the, the Soviets get there? <laughs> It was a defector. He just took the airplane south until he thought it ran out of fuel and he punched out. And the airplane kept going. But it still had fuel. Now that's why they couldn't find it. It wasn't there. I said, well, that's because you're looking in the wrong place. <laughs> Look over here. Because <laughs> by this time, an entire intelligence community was involved. Um, she drew this. So I took this sketch. This is a sketch. And I handed it to the search team. And so I'm looking at this huge map. And it's 200 miles this way, 200 miles down. So she looks at, the, at that map and uh, goes up to the map and says, I, well, over here, here's where it is. The X, where the pin went into the map. And they sent a helicopter out to investigate the area. And uh, shortly after they landed, uh, a native comes out of the jungle carrying a piece of metal. And it turned out it was from the airplane that crashed and was within about a mile of where it was, where the actual site was. All the information was in the field before the airplane was found. And the CIA did a special check on that to make sure, and so did NSA, to make sure that my story did hold water. The information was there before we knew where it was. The woman who drew the sketch, referenced by Dale and President Carter, was an Air Force officer. She and an SRI remote viewer, also crucial to the case's success, have never come forward. The research out of SRI showed that remote viewing had no predictable scientific limits or even theories to explain it. As the team racked up success after success, higher and higher up the chain of command, the question was asked, how can any of this even be possible? You know, I said, well, we've done this remote viewing experiment and the, uh, the results are, are sig very significant. He said, one of those guys is blind and the other one's crazy. Now, <laughs> the perfect team for examining <laughs> psychic abilities. <laughs> That's what I thought. Oh boy. There's of course no way to deal with people who don't want to know. A storm starts brewing and we get a new director of Office of Research and Development. He could not accept the reality of paranormal activity. He said he knew that this was not real. And a guy in the back of the room jumped up and said, I know what this is. Somebody's taking notes to see which of us are gullible. Whoever's taking notes, I want you to know, I'm not buying any of this. And he marched out. 
A week later, I came back and I said, did you evaluate it? Can you tell me what you thought about it? And he says, he said, no, I didn't evaluate it. And he said, I'm not going to. And I said, what? We're fundamentalists. There may be something to it, but it may be demonic. <laughs> we don't have anything to do with this. You are working with people who are in league with the devil, and you're part of the Antichrist movement. And I picked up the data and walked out. <laughs> and deniers who think there is no consciousness beyond our skulls are a powerful force in American society are anti-science because they, they do not respect or accept facts. They are people whose worldview is based on faith of a very particular kind and belief in dogma. It is about dogma, absolutely from a religious standpoint all the way down to, I mean, people that are afraid of it, which is half the people on the planet, so damaging, it's... I had a senior senator in camera, in a meeting in camera, stand up and say, you, sir, are doing the work of the devil, and you will burn in the fires of hell and walk out. That's a senior lawmaker. And then in the same meeting, when we broke for coffee, I had another senior lawmaker hug me and whisper in my ear, you're doing God's work, son. Now, which one scares you the worst? I think science research is important because it's um, a, an essential part of reality which um, science hasn't yet taken note of. Furthermore, there's a lot of misconception around people just um, assuming without any proof that, that there's no such thing. It's just a piece of dogma. And science should not be about dogma. How many people say they've, they've witnessed things that do not fit within a, a materialistic paradigm, and then they're told you're deluded because your experience doesn't conform to our dogma? This is so fundamentally anti-scientific, it's utterly appalling. So once again, this troubled me because I love science and I respect this tremendous evolution of science for the last 400 years. But when people speaking with the authority of science say, for example, that all experiences can only be functions of the brain, and if you have any experiences that cannot be explained within a materialistic paradigm, you're deluded, then this is dehumanizing, arrogant, pompous, and closed-minded, and those terms should never come in the same paragraph of, de of, of defining and explaining science. When the evidence just gets to be overwhelming and the, and the groundswell here is growing, I would say before too long, if you still insist that the mind is nothing more than an emergent property of the brain, it will be widely recognized, you're just ignorant. And the key point about physics is physics is always evolving. Our knowledge of physics is always expanding. And phenomena which people reject as impossible today may not be rejected as impossible tomorrow because tomorrow we'll have a more extensive theory of physics. Enter this next wonderful reality and the most controversial of the people and it shocked me that they found anything to object to. This is a hardcore scientist. Well, I'm very happy to be here. My name is Russell Targ. I'm a physicist and it's my great pleasure to tell you about the remarkable work we did at Stanford Research Institute investigating psychic ability. A small Wikipedia biographical page that's described that I was born in Chicago, went to Columbia, worked with Hal Putoff on the pseudoscience called uh, remote viewing. So we had a chance for fish and chips and a cup of tea. We must be in England finally. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> There's a time when I was ill and I didn't want my biography to be that one dimensional. So I wrote in that I had been a pioneer in the development of the laser and published many, many papers in lasers. And the Wikipedia masters kept erasing all my laser papers. They said, 
they said to me, people are not interested in your laser work. We just want to know about your work with the pseudoscience. And I said, well, most of my life has been spent with lasers. And they wouldn't allow me to do that. They kept, they banned me from Wikipedia. And finally, I got the help of Brian Josephson. And it was only through J Josephson's intercession that I got to bring my biography up to speed. Do you think that consciousness is built into quantum theory? This, of course, is extremely heretical. But fortunately, I um, not only got tenure, but I've retired, so I don't need to worry about um, being a heretic. Sorry, I'm not with you exactly. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, anyway, what, what are these are taking your picture? Uh, yes. Uh, you're being interviewed, are you? Fun? I was, yes. You I were? Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Well, what's it to do with? I mean, uh... Uh, uh, well, uh, it's really about some research work. A what? Research work, yeah. Research stuff? Yes. Okay. So you're, you're okay. able finally okay. to tell the complete truth? Well, actually, people uh, would probably not uh, contemplate um, uh, getting rid of a Nobel Prize winner, so I had more or less had freedom in what I could do. Funding was a different matter. They actually told certain people, uh, we'll fund you if you work with anybody other than Josephson. But will you tell these fools I'm not crazy? Make them listen to me before it's too late! By and large, the critics who've been interested enough in our work to come to our laboratory, we have asked them to take part in experiments and experience remote viewing themselves, which is often very accurate indeed. One of the biggest skeptics was Under Secretary of Defense Walter LaBerge, who kept hearing leaks about the mad scientists of Menlo Park. So he decided to pay a visit in his Air Force helicopter, landing on the SRI campus lawn and causing quite the dust-up to Hal and Russ's low profile. Although he thought it ridiculous, LaBerge allowed himself to become a subject, and despite no prior psychic experience, he correctly and in great detail imagined where his attaché was hiding. He then became one of the team's biggest supporters, along with other senators, congressmen, and generals who dropped in on the lab and got similar results. It was becoming apparent that this was a common ability, but how could they show that when it was all secret? Their first clue to how common intuitive abilities are came when a remote viewer didn't show up for work. So I had a chance to go to San Jose, Costa Rica, center of a mountainous country. And then each day, a remote viewer back in Middle Park, California, would describe where I am. Well, on a particular day, I had a chance to do a trick. I got an airplane, I flew out, and I landed at an island that belonged to Colombia. It also turned out that on that day, the remote viewer didn't show up. So Russell decided, well, okay, I'll do the remote viewing. What, what can I do? So Russell's trying to uh, suppress this data, but it just keeps coming in. He says, okay, well, you know, I guess I'm wrong. I mean, I, I no reason to be in an airport. And not only that, I see ocean at the end of the runway. And I know there's, you know, ocean is miles away in San Jose, Costa Rica. Well, in fact, that's exactly where I was because I'd taken this little side trip. Did you actually take that picture or is that a standard uh, picture? Somebody else took the picture who, uh, when we had this data, they went out and took it from the same angle showing that even a scientist can do good remote viewing. This led to a request from their CIA handlers to bring in someone with absolutely no psychic ability to get a baseline against their best. That didn't work out so well. She was statistically the best results they ever had, even better than the infamous Pat Price. We were asked to bring in somebody who was willing to be a control person for the program. And I chose to work with Hella Hammond, who's an old friend of the family. She promised me she had never done ESP experiments before, and she would be very happy to be part of our program. This is a remote viewing experiment with Russ Targ and Hella Hammond. Today is Friday, October 11th, 1974. It's 20 minutes to four in the afternoon. Russ Targ and Hella Hammond are in the first floor laboratory at SRI. Hal has left SRI. He will select a randomly chosen destination. Hello. 
was looking up at the structure that must be three, four stories high. A weird zigzag uh, going horizontally like a series of mountains, sort of peaks on top of each other. Can be just shapes. The side of the structure seems to be open to the sky too. Squares and then squares and then squares going downward like into a trough. It's definitely some kind of a conduit. This is just where Hal Putoff was standing at the time of Hella Hammond's very first remote viewing. Perhaps the most dangerous secret of all, the one that Russell Targ has worked his whole life to release, is that anybody can be psychic. And we have a target now that requires a drawing or a description. So I'd like you to quiet your mind and make a little sketch of the surprising images that show up in your awareness. You want to get on paper the shape and the form pertaining to Paul's location. You have Paul and Cynthia in a bright green dress located at some interesting place. Do we have any falling water in the audience? This is the waterfall coming down. Four pages of the waterfalls. My primary um, purpose in coming to this conference is to actually to see what I can do to become a world-class remote viewer. I couldn't believe it, but it, it's different when it's different when you actually do it. I have no formal training. It's really about sending the message across to people that. If you put your mind and heart to something, you know, it's, everything is possible. The world is your oyster, you know? When a whole room of people are able to do that, it's not just me, it's not just my imagination, it's all of us. You know, it's the science part of it. Everybody really wants hardcore data. I think it's still a question of what it means to be really human and what it means to be a you know, a, a proper human being, whatever that might mean, and what is the essence of who we are. And I think that if the world actually had an access to that answer, I think it would change everything. So it looks pretty good. I'm used to it in Las Vegas. Psychic abilities are real, and you have these abilities. And now we've got a free ESP tester on the internet. By the time we finished, we knew more about uh, our remote viewers than NASA knew about astronauts. There's nothing different about them at all. These are just normal people. Like musical ability, you've got virtuosos at one end of the scale, you've got tone-deaf people at the other. Now, it's just in our culture, no one values, quote, ESP functioning. It's just being human is basically what it's all about. Could it be that psychic ability is much more common than we think? Even internal agents at CIA back in 1975 were secretly doing it. According to original program manager Ken Kress. Now it turns out a couple of people around OTS, a, a lady by the name of Francine and a man by the name of Ed, they decided they wanted to be subjects. Subjects. And they were CIA employees now. These were not SRI employees. Actually got them involved with a uh, with a Libyan analyst. I got gibberish, as I remember, from Francine, but, you know, Ed was an engineer, so he comes up like Pat with very specific stuff. He says, what I see is a, a Soviet uh, uh, radar that is involved with an air defense system. You know, he goes on and on with all this stuff. And so I package all this up, send it to the Libyan analyst, and he said, you know, we have an agent that we have not vetted who says similar things. And I said, <laughs> you know, that's news to me. See, when they were with us, it was not clear whether they had come to see if there's defects in our model or whether they had come to be trained or both. Yeah, well, there may have been a, a slight uh, subterfuge, shall we say, and then I might have sent them out there as evaluators and they may have been motivated as participants. <laughs>
By 1981, the program had become more and more operational. The government was less and less interested in research. I wanted to be free of all this secrecy. Which, uh, from a scientific standpoint, was, was not so good. But on the other hand, of course, from the funding standpoint, can't complain. And I brought that to our contracting officer. And he said, Russ, you know we're not doing research anymore. And I said, well, we, we look at this. We think about what we're doing. He said, I'm not paid to think. I'm paid to find out what DIA wants you to do and then see that you do it. I was heartbroken. Hal and Ingo were more secretive than ever. And now Ingo was in charge of the Army psychics and had made the program so complicated that only he could teach it. And I got a note from my partner, Hal, questioning whether I was really making a contribution to the program. What the most interesting data at SRI pointed to was exactly why Russell wanted to leave. It was a secret so big, he felt that if the general public could truly get it, it might bring enemies together, and it might even change the world. Russell was kind of the idea man, was uh, always kind of pushing the bad scientist type of thing, uh, where he actually looked the part to some degree. <laughs> When I decided to leave, this was in 1985, we had dozens of psychics and lots of laboratories and people out there as consultants and so on. And I ended up spending all my time not doing research, but handling personnel issues and funding issues and writing grants and proposals. And I'd get up in the morning and say, well, you know, actually I could be getting back to research. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. I say, no more secrets. SRI's intelligence work with psychics would go on for another decade, mostly unnoticed, until one of their greatest covert triumphs became their most infamous leak. Remember Jimmy Carter's telling of finding the downed Russian bomber in the Congo? In 1995, President Carter recounted that during a talk to Emory University, accidentally outing our top secret program to CNN. Students submitted questions on numerous topics, both serious and lighthearted, and as always, President Carter answered them all. The release of that information contributed to the end of the remote viewing program at SRI. After Russell and Hal left the program, it continued under Ed May but eventually it confronted the giggle factor. So I would ask the intelligence community to watch what we do for the next few years and... The CIA had publicly derided the Army Run program, and in the end, they were asked to take it on again. It's a pretty low priority for the intelligence community, and uh, it's, it's better done on the outside. Instead, they commissioned a third-party report to, quote, see if it had been valuable to operational intelligence. And that's our report for tonight. So, what do all these stories add up to? Well, the two experts commissioned by the CIA report disagree. First, there's psychologist Ray Hyman from the University of Oregon. My considered judgment, if, if someone pushed me hard right now, I have to say uh, the odds are 99 to 1 that there's nothing to remote viewing. I think remote viewing has been demonstrated over the 20 years of work that's been sponsored by the government. Ed May was very upset at the way the AIR report was done. He was very upset that they did not look at the operational remote viewing and that they did not allow us to talk to the operational remote viewers. I think he was quite disappointed that they narrowed the focus so much so that really it might have been a predetermined conclusion that they wanted to kill the program. I think that anybody who says we haven't proven it yet hasn't really looked at the data. I think, frankly, people don't want to look at the data. They have their worldviews. They don't want those worldviews rocked. I think anybody who looks at it with a real open mind would be convinced. I, I, I became 100% certain that it was real acquisition of information. I became 100% certain that it had potentially real intelligence significance and I became 100% certain that it never would. Why? What I thought were the issues that would make this a useful tool were both ignored, denied, and in addition, later dropped, which is screening of subjects to find the superstars. You're tested carefully to find your special talents. Your scores will be on your own satisfaction.
using the tools that I thought we had identified, which were politically not correct then to use, and which are politically impossible to use today. There you go. Well, you're here, really arrived. You can loosen up a bit now. You would have a latent ability that maybe a lot of humans have that you'd be able to tease out of some people with some sort of training program or something, and you'd end up with what ended up. After we did our report, uh, a few months later, maybe a year later, I received a phone call from somebody who worked high up in the government, and he wanted to know if this was for real. And I said, I stand by what I wrote in the report. And he said, well, I'm going to see if I can get access to the operational work. He called me back and he said he got access to it and none of the boxes had been opened. Jessica's the president of the American Statistical Society and she says by the numbers, remote viewing has a higher efficacy than aspirin. What was the CIA trying so hard to hide that they wouldn't even allow their best data to be seen? And why did the CIA just like those regular Joe Army guys so much? We had the total support of five administrations in a row. Five straight administrations supported us, Russell. Privately. <laughs> so a very illuminating trip. You never know who your friends are. Since I was told by the DCI the project was over, that was it. It was over. Ken was removed as CIA program manager shortly before Pat Price's death, and he assumes that CIA involvement ended with Price. No, I heard that they were discussing the Stargate program out of channel. In other words, if you're talking about a classified program in an unclassified area, it looks like a security violation. We need to investigate this further. Um, now what? The gamble was, ignore it, it'll go away. The suggestion to me was that, okay, let people just wonder about it. Uh, but if you start uh, complaining about it, it, it will affirm that we do have a program. They didn't, they didn't really want to go that route. Russell's first interview with one of the most spectacular spies from his SRI days was a no-show. Later, the agent called to say they were still doing it and were afraid to talk about it. Beyond the giggle factor, what was the big deal? What does all of this mean? Could we be missing the big picture here? And no, that's not right. I told you before, um, two, two people that I trust, that are one of whom's in the position to know, says that the program's still going on. Really? Just how useful is remote viewing? How far would Russell go? to tell the world what had become painfully obvious to him. This was something that Russell was inspired to consider after witnessing Ingo predict that Chinese A-bomb test three days in advance, and similar work by Stephen Schwartz, and it involved precognition, or seeing the future. The final straw was when he received a package in the mail from the ghost of an old friend regarding some water towers that had haunted him for years. I get the impression of a water treatment plant. It looks like uh, water storage tanks. It's a service room down here. In Pat Price's first series of experiments, he got the shape and dimensions of his swimming pool target within 12 inches. But he also called it a water treatment plant, even drawing water towers, which missed the whole point of the target. Years after Pat Price's death, I received a historical picture book. It was a gift from the city manager of Palo Alto that when I opened the picture book to Rinconada Park 75 years ago, it had been a water purification plant and the two water tanks that Price had indicated indeed were right where he put them and they would undoubtedly have been the tallest thing in the city of Palo Alto uh, 75 years ago. With Pat's reminder of timeless awareness in hand, I hatched a plan to ditch the spy business and try and wake up the world. At nine, seven minute nine. This is the Commodities Exchange in New York City, circa 1983. It was right here Russell Targ's new company, Delphi, decided to tell the world that they were psychic. 
We've been predicting silver prices two to four days in advance. Our investors made profits in the middle six figures. Something I couldn't do while I was a psychic spy. Predicting the volatile market nine times in a row even landed them on the cover of the Wall Street uh, Journal. Being right nine times out of nine. Again, being right in anything in life nine times out of nine is unheard of. But uh, some of the more spectacular and successful trades were actually on the short side, or they were making a prediction and anticipation of the market coming down, so going against the trend. But there are still elements that are not understood, so it does not always work. So I wouldn't put my life savings behind a remote viewing of the future. Investor demands and the weight of their own success led to the second round not doing as well. Money dried up and the skeptics pounced. Russell would have to go even farther to prove his point about ESP. A lot farther. When they first invited me to come, and their letter to me said, please come to the Soviet Union so we can exchange propaganda. I didn't have a big concern about that. I trusted Russell. He went through the process of asking permission. I assume that I'm actually quite confident of that because had he not done so, he would be in jail. No, I did not ask any permission to go to Russia. I just went. Of course, they can't reveal secret information, and I declared my independence and left. And they said, is there anything you'd like to see as long as you're here? And I said, oh yes, I would like to have a peek at Brezhnev's office. I would just like to see where he sits. <laughs> we were once targeted to describe Premier Brezhnev's office in the Kremlin with Hella Hammond. Who we was were the control person initially. That's right. <laughs> and indeed, it's just as she described it, this odd red leather door held mm -hmm. in place by upholstery tack, the huge desk on the right, window on the left, and a door and a wall behind the desk. Mm -hmm. And we did not go downstairs into the computer room. When we were talking to the Soviet Academy of Sciences, for example, a physicist got up and said, it seems that if a experienced viewer can focus his or her attention anywhere on the planet, then it's not possible to hide anything anymore. Isn't that true? And the Russians in the audience were quite shocked with that. I could hear the teacups rattling. The very idea of secrets is not our true nature. Openness is. Forty years ago, when I stood in this exact place. I don't think anyone really expected Russian and American uh, scientists to work together. In 1987, and I started teaching remote viewing in Russia, and uh, no one in Russia knew about this on that moment. Yuri is one of the Russian psychologists that Russell met during his travels. And now, he's come out of the cold and brought some friends. And I decided to go to uh, United States of America to, to take training from Russell Targ. For the first, it was for, uh, first for Russell Targ. Little did I know when I left SRI that the Russians would become capitalists. Nowadays, Russians are invading. Um, having watched the end of the Soviet Union as a cadet at West Point and then fast forwarding to today, uh, I'm a little bit lost. Now, Russian people are very enthusiastic about remote viewing. Прогнозы и предсказания на спортивные события на сегодняшний день э, точность предсказаний в районе 75-80%. В России за эту точность очень хорошо платят. Remote viewing instructor Lori Williams has brought a group of 20 Russian doctors and engineers to Los Angeles to learn remote viewing for themselves. So, so the event she was asking about had already occurred. So the subconscious
Oh, I got a phone call from a man that, uh, with a strong Russian accent, and he was asking me if uh, I would be willing to teach remote viewing to Russians. We are not remote viewing yet. And so when he called and said, why don't we do something in Los Angeles, then it just sort of grew from there. We started planning this about a year ago, this class in Los Angeles. So. We're going to do a quick review. Благодаря тем инструментам, которые мы здесь получаем. Okay, so the students all received individual targets, so they don't. No one's reviewing someone else's target. They've all got their own, and we've actually been working on these targets for four days. By viewing something repeatedly, it like it creates a memory path to the target, it makes it easier to view. It's a so most likely, it's a person. He did some research. Humans have been asking these deep questions about the nature of their reality, and these are just using the tools of our society to ask these deep questions in a different way. The ancients did too, and they're with what they had available to them. The scientific model has to change continuously to accommodate our knowledge. And if we're learning more, then we have to fit that into our bigger picture of understanding reality. And here's a sketch, right? Yeah, it's a sketch. Yeah, it's a sketch. And then it came out like a moon. No, then I thought that it's a moon. Then he thought it was a moon? This is a very kinesthetic day today. They're going to be using their hands, creating 3D models of the target using uh, Sculpey clay, uh, modeling clay. They're going to be... There's a lot he got about it. It looks like a spider. It has a little head, a little... How, what spider has Legs. Legs. Clicks, yeah. Take <laughs> oh, no. well, no. He called him Armstrong. He said that's Neil Armstrong. Is that it? That is all? Okay, that's you ready all. for your feedback? Yeah, that's it. Okay, hold on to your seats, folks, because this was the Apollo 11 trip to the moon. Yeah, it's Apollo 11. Apollo 11. Apollo 11 trip to the moon with Neil Armstrong. Now that's truly what we refer to as a holy shit moment. <laughs> <laughs>
The main idea from all of our research is that there is no separation, especially no separation in consciousness. More than machinery, we need our humanity. If the world were to accept this research, we would have to recognize that we are not isolated within our brains. We would have to recognize that we live in the earth, not on the earth. We live embedded in the biosphere of earth and that all consciousness is interconnected and interrelated. And that's why we can transmit the power of love, the power of healing. Maybe it's very subliminal, but it definitely exists. I came across this and said, you know, every, there's a lot of people who think you're nuts, and, but, you know, hang on, and <laughs> maybe, maybe you're not. <laughs> we should always be open to our imagination because once in a while, some of the imaginations will come true. So I think it's time to close up and move on. So Hella returned to Los Angeles to resume her life as a professional photographer. She died of cancer in 1992. But not before she uncovered the lost temple of Alexandria, Egypt, with Stephen Schwartz and the Egyptian government. They placed the first stake within 12 inches of where it had been buried for thousands of years and put the skeptics to rest, at least for that day. She was given no information beyond the general hilltop location. Things are going to change because science is changing. Ingo took the closure of the Army program hard and went into seclusion. We reconnected in later years and had a chance to talk about old times. I'm going to talk about the future because I think that we're far too much trapped in the past. Sam got very talented cellists who had not re remote viewed. They went into an expanded state and got impressions. They then took it up to the composers. No, Atmospheric, like, two not opposing but integral related forces. Triple it up and down. What was the feedback? Well, they didn't know it was in the envelope. It's very, very close. It's very descriptive of bugs. So when playing it, listening to it kind of makes you itch. <laughs> Kit Green says he still consults for the CIA. You know, Green, think, 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 think. And I have. I've thought about it for many years. I'll give you the answer. The most precious secrets are hidden in plain sight. That's a stupid expression, but you know what? It happens sometimes to be true. He told me he collaborates regularly with Hal, but on what? Neither one of them will say. Oh, yeah. I've got it going through me, if you can see. Hal Putoff resigned from the SRI remote viewing program at the height of its success, but he did go back to remote viewing at least one more time. Hal repeated my silver forecasting experiment for his child's high school. He raised $25,000 from the stock market for a class field trip to Washington. Then he went back to seeking to extract energy from the vacuum in his Austin laboratory. Well, we're, we've got our hands in every pot. It turns out that Kit and Hal really were collaborating. Kit brought Hal into a top secret Pentagon UFO assessment program revealed in December 2017 by the New York Times. Oh, and Hal says they've recovered UFO debris, but that's another story. Pat Price's grave in North Hollywood remains unmarked, and his death remains a mystery. And as for Russell Targ, he continues to tell his story, showing people just like you and me all around the world that we're all psychic. At the end of the film, they say, no animals were harmed in the making of this film. 
So I'd like to ask you, is it fair to say that no physics were harmed in the making of this film? Physics isn't, but um, physicists might be. Thank you.